In today's video, we're going to be building a disc grinder, including a stand assembly from Bex Armory and a detailed overview of wiring the motor and variable speed drive. The goal is to demystify the process of putting together a quality DIY disc grinder. Before we go any further, I'd like to thank Richard at Bex Armory for supplying the chassis kit and Brian from House Works for his videos on VFD wiring and enclosures. Make sure to give both of these guys a follow. As always on builds like this one, I have affiliate links to all the used components in the video description. These links do help out the channel monetarily. In section one of our build, we will be welding together this disc grinder chassis from Bex Armory called the BA Vander Sander. Richard saw some of my comments on Instagram about looking for a disc grinder and offered the kit to the channel. The package comes with all of the necessary components and hardware you will need to get it built and operational, as well as a set of plans to work off of. When I got these pieces, I haphazardly went straight into the build without instructions or watching Richard's video build on his YouTube channel. This resulted in me needing to grind a few welds off here and there. To help every future customer of this kit, I made a set of detailed build instructions that I'll link below. I'm using Patreon to host a PDF, but note that downloading it will be 100% free. While all of the welds in this kit do not need to be 100% square, there are a few pieces that need special attention to keep as square as possible, and I made sure to note these in the instructions. These sections will be those that pertain to the alignment of your motor to the work rest. If you end up making a mistake here, it's not the end of the world, since you can use the shim stock to get your motor square. However, the closer you can get from the start, the better. The biggest mistakes I made in the welding process was laying down beads where they should not have been. Most notably the tool rest receptacle, where I ended up having to grind off and re-weld the faceplate. So take special care to follow the directions. With the kit's components all welded up, the only thing left to do is to paint them and assemble the unit. However, in my case, since I rushed into the build, I had a few welds on retaining nuts, which I went back and affixed. This chassis is designed to sit on the provided rubber feet However, if you wanted to direct mount it to the table, that would also be possible with standoffs. Both the pivot points on the machine are designed to be used with thrust washers, and I found their rotation to be nice and smooth. At this point, it's time to attach our motor to the stand, and since we won't be needing it, I'll remove the stock motor mount. This motor came from Amazon and is a 1.5 horsepower 3-phase motor with a 56C frame faceplate configuration. It's a 1725 RPM TEFC motor, which means that it's totally enclosed. These enclosed motors are ideal for grinding. The last thing I did to the stand was tap a 3 8 by 16 hole into the base plate and then run a bolt in from the top. I did this because I don't foresee myself using the base rotation feature and wanted it to be locked down. This is obviously personal preference. With the chassis assembly complete, we can move on to section two of our build, which is wiring. The box on top of the motor can be oriented in four different directions, and I chose to have the cord coming out of the back of the unit. The VFD we're using for this build was recommended to me by Brian House for wiring up a three-phase motor to a 110 volt plug. We're going to also be using Brian's enclosure method in this build, so we can go ahead and remove the plastic cover off of our VFD. The fan was mounted to the plastic cover, so I used a 440 tap to thread some holes into the heatsink then a die to cut threads onto some nails to be used as bolts to affix the fan to the heatsink. Like Brian, I'm going to be using a 50 caliber ammo can as the enclosure. He has a bunch of detailed information on why he decided to use this method on his YouTube channel if you're interested in learning more. I drilled some holes on the outside of the can and then used self-tapping screws to affix the VFD to the can. You don't want your VFD moving around in the enclosure over time. These cheap VFDs come with a control panel that can be extended away from the VFD circuit board. I'll be mounting mine onto the top of the enclosure. There seems to be some variation in style of these panels, making a few of them more suited for a flush mount. In my case, I decided to mill a window on the lid to accept the cable connector for the panel and then used some two-part epoxy to permanently affix the control panel to the lid. I drilled some holes into the back of the enclosure to feed in and out my wires. A cheap set of plastic cable protectors are a must here since they not only protect the cables from being damaged, but also hold the wires in place securely. For the cable between the VFD and the motor, I'll be using a 10-4 power whip from Amazon 
that I'll cut the plug off of and save for a future project. To get power from the wall, I'll be using a 14.3 110 power cable. Alrighty, I'm gonna run through the wiring here. I have 110 coming in. We have three wires, 14 gauge 110. Don't worry about this burn mark. I was trying to use a lighter for the heat shrink and that didn't work very well. But anyway, we got a ground and a neutral and a hot. And those are gonna go on these three terminals to the left here. So I'm gonna get those on. One thing to note here is if you look at this green board, it has labeling on it. So this is load, neutral, ground, and then here it says uh, UVW. Now notice I put the neutral and the load separate, and the UV and W are also wired differently because the box that this VFD came in, this box that y'all may be able to kind of see here, actually had different labeling on the box. And if I never would have opened it, I never would have saw the labeling on the board. So I'm guessing they use this board on multiple different configurations. So I'm gonna use the labeling on the box and I actually taped that labeling on the inside of my enclosure box here so that I have a reference in the future. So I'm gonna wire it up as if I never saw the green board labels and hope that that works. If it doesn't work, I'll revert back to the labels that are actually on the board. So like I said, we have our neutral load and ground. I kept this one loose because we're actually gonna use a ground from the other cable as well and try to jam it into the same terminal. So I left this one super loose and now we're gonna wire up the, the wire that goes to the motor. This is four wire 10 gauge. As y'all saw, I took a dryer whip and turned it in to my uh, connection here between the two. You can also go to Lowe's or Home Depot and buy it by the foot but I found it easier just to order this online. So I have these little connectors on here. We're gonna wire it up as such. The white is gonna go to W, the red is gonna go to U, and the black is gonna go to V, and then the green is gonna go to our ground. <laughs> So as a recap, we have both of our grounds on this terminal all the way to the left. The enclosure box that came with this system said that this one was the load and this one was the neutral. So that's how we wired it, black then white coming from the wall. So this is gonna be 110. And then going to the motor, we have W, V, and U. W for white, V for black, and U for red. So that's how we wired this one. We'll see if it works. Alrighty, these motors are wired up on T numbers and on motors like this, three phase motors, you have a low volt option and a high volt option. Uh, this motor has the wiring diagram on the side of it. I'll put a nice clean picture in this tutorial so you can see it, but they're all pretty much the same on the T numbers. On a 110N motor, we're dealing with the low volt system. So we're talking about T4, 5, and 6 are all tied together and you can see I've done that here with this little screw on nut. So this T4, T5, and T6. Uh, note that all these motors probably have different colors. This one has no colors. So it's nice to go through it before you start wiring and kind of group the pairs. You'll be dealing with uh, T7 and T1. So that's this guy will be connected. T8 and T1, no I'm sorry, T8 and T2. And then T9 and T3. Those are gonna be your three uh, pairings that will correspond to these three wires coming in. And then your ground will be connected to the motor body itself. So the T7 and T1 will be connected to our red wire. The T2 and T8 will be connected to our black wire. And the T3 and the T9 will be connected to our white wire. So I'm gonna go ahead and knock that out. All right, so I just plugged it in, so that's a good sign. It all turned on. Let's see, forward, reverse, it's in the stop mode. The dial, let's see, at zero. 
and 65, I guess. It's kind of a weird spot to stop. All right, so I'm just gonna put it on 22, I guess, and uh, see if it goes. I'm gonna hit run. Hey, motor turns. So it looks like forward is counterclockwise. And if I change the speed, let's see, I change the direction clockwise. Cool. So one thing I noticed that this does not have is an off switch. Uh, so that may be something I wire in in the future, just a, a complete shut off switch uh, for this unit, or maybe I'll put it at the wall, but uh, there's, no, there's no off. So just keep that in mind. All right, to add a switch to this thing, it's pretty simple. This is our power wire coming in. I took it off of these three terminals. I left the ground alone, the connector, and I added two connectors that are a little different. These go up onto a tab, and it's actually the type of switch that I had left over from the heat treat oven build. So I put that switch into the door. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and tie the ground in to just a bolt that I put through the door and I'm gonna run that ground all the way back to here. So uh, let's go ahead and do that. So got a little extra slack here, as you can see. Uh, before we mess around with the power coming in, we're gonna work backwards from the board. I have two extra 14 gauge wires here, uh, and then we're gonna, we're gonna put them on the same way that they were on to start. So uh, we have the neutral wire on terminal three from the left, so we're gonna go ahead and put that guy on. I'm sorry, actually we're gonna put the neutral wire on. Terminal three from the left, so that's there. Okay, then we're gonna put the load in. Two from the left. That's on there. We're gonna push these off to the side. And then uh, we'll go ahead and throw the ground in there. Here's the ground. This one I actually bent uh, probably about a 45 degree angle down so I can get it in there with the uh, with the ground that's going to the motor. So this one comes up from the bottom. So I'll take that one off. Got this guy coming up from the bottom and then got the motor ground coming up from the top. It's a little tight fit, but they both fit in there pretty good once you, once you get the angles right. Okay. All right, we're gonna put our door on, or top or cover, okay. All right, I got ring connectors on the grounds. It took me a while because I had to drill out the connectors I had. They weren't large enough for a quarter inch. Uh, so that was kind of a pain, but this is the ground that's coming from the board, which is connected to the ground that's coming from the motor, and which is about to be connected to the ground coming from the wall. So that's this one right here. So we got both those grounds on here. And then we'll put a quarter 20 nut on the end. Now we are going to connect our power to these bottom two terminals. Now I have the two additional wires coming from the load and the neutral on the board. Uh, we'll go ahead and put them on the same side so our white neutral is going to stack with the one coming from the wall. And then our load is going to also stack with the one coming from the wall. All right, now we have a switch and a bunch of cables. All right, it's a little precarious closing this guy up just because my panel wire is pretty short. I saw some other VFDs that seem to have longer panel wires, but uh, this one's short, so you kind of have to half close. While we're doing so, I'm making sure that my cables are kind of falling nicely. You know, I think I'm going to get another zip tie here. All right, now that we have our cables kind of managed, we're going to tuck them in, carefully start closing this box. Try to keep them tucked in the corners. And then we're gonna take our, our uh, panel wire and very carefully line it up with the controller. Close 
closing her up. Everything fits. We're gonna plug her in. Okay, we have our box plugged in. As you can see, the panel has not lit up, so that's a good sign because the switch is in the off position. I'm gonna go ahead and turn the power on. All right, good deal. We have a box. We have it in forward. We're gonna turn it up and hit run. Okay, so this VFD has capacitors in it, so even when I hit the off button, the panel stays on. Uh, what I like to do is run that capacity out. So I'll just hit run again, and then it'll zero itself out, and we're done. So this seems to all be working well. Uh, last thing we have to do is put the disc on there. I think I may also put a bead of silicone around the edge of this. Even though it's epoxied on, it just feels like a good idea. So uh, that's the box, that's the wiring. With the unit all wired up, we can move on to section three, which is installing the disc and testing this guy out. I got this flat aluminum nine inch disc from True Grit. It's designed to mate up with a five eighths of an inch arbor and has three set screws in the hub. I was originally contemplating a one degree bevel disc. However, after reading some form posts, I figured I'd go with a flat disc first. I will say I haven't had any issues so far in my testing with a seven inch blade, but I may still get a beveled disc in the future to test it out as well. With the disc mounted, I ran the grinder at a slow speed and applied some 3M feathering compound. This adhesive allows you to make your own circular sanding sheets with standard 9x11 sandpaper and change them out easily, which is pretty darn economical. 50 sheets of 120 grit Rhino Wet sandpaper comes out to around 90 cents per sheet. I ran a quick test with some leftover stabilized pecan and was pretty shocked by how flat it came out in a relatively short period of time. The horizontal position seems particularly useful for flattening scales. At the time of filming this video, I had the seven inch buoy roughly ground to a 36 grit finish preheat treatment. So I decided to play around on the disc before going to the oven. With one 90 cent piece of 120 grit sandpaper, I was able to remove about 85% of the 36 grit scratches and flatten my bevels. This feels pretty phenomenal to me from both a cost savings and time savings perspective. I can't wait to do my finish grinding on this knife with this disc grinding setup. I want to once again thank Bex Armory for sending me this kit and answering all my questions during the build. The links for the instructions to this build and the kit itself will be in the description of the video. If y'all enjoyed this video, don't forget to like it and subscribe to the channel since that is really what helps grow Redbeard Ops and allows me to make more videos for the knife making community. With that, I'll catch y'all on the flip side.